Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. The kids are exuberant today. They're, uh, they have lots of energy. They're excited to be here. I hope you're excited, as excited as they are, with perhaps a small amount more self-control, but don't be too self-controlled. I notice those folks fall asleep. So <laughs> we're in Romans chapter 8. By the way, uh, the kids that come in, they come on the buses. They don't have parents that take them to church and teach them how to act and how to behave. And a lot of the things, uh, sometimes, I notice sometimes adults get a little annoyed because uh, kids will be acting out or talking during prayer or whatever. They've never had parents that say, hey, you don't talk when they're praying and uh, teach them how to act in church. And so it would be fine if you notice something's a little out of line to just go up and uh, sit next to a kid and say, hey, you know, a little out of line and just explain it to them. How many of you realize that a hymn book's a bit of a mystery to some people? The way that, you remember trying, nobody ever taught me how to, to read one, two, three, four verses at a time, and then things like DS and CODA and things like that. Those are just things that people don't know. And you know. We don't think about if somebody gets saved later in life has never read music or sung from a hymn book. Uh, they, those are things that people just don't know how to do. And so you could take a kid at the beginning of the service and sit down by him and say, hey, let's look at how to use a hymn book and explain some things. Or maybe you could ask the kids how to use a hymn book and they could explain it to you. And it might be as much of a help. But uh, these are just things that we have to be mindful of. I'm so glad that we have a future generation that loves the Lord Jesus. Amen. And boy, they, they had a good Sunday school class this morning. They learned what the gospel was this morning. And they learned that the writers of the gospels were Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they learned that the gospel is about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And two or three of them told me what they learned in Sunday school this morning. And so they know a lot more than a lot of people do. And praise the Lord for that. We could use help with our with our uh, bus ministry, with going out visiting on Saturdays, talking to parents, and, and uh, seeing parents get saved and all those things. And so I want to want us to be mindful of that. Romans chapter eight this morning. We will read beginning in verse thirty one and uh, to down to chapter nine. And I actually am going to read through verse three of chapter nine. So verse thirty one of Romans eight, if you found it in your scripture, and we're going to read down to chapter nine and verse three. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I say the truth in Christ. My, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh who are Israelites. Now let's stop there and let's go to the Lord. Father, we do need your help this morning because of the truths of the Scripture. Lord, though they're plainly laid out, there is so much depth in your word in this place this morning. And so, Father, I just ask that as, as we endeavor to understand not only eternal security, but, Father, the perspective we need to have as heirs in Christ. I pray that the truths that we learned this morning would help us to live it, not only triumphantly for Jesus, but, Father, with great security, 
And Lord, with great purpose, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in that transition period. Right in the middle of our text, we transition from the material that we were talking about uh, when we really tied together or finished up this portion of Romans that's about spiritual victory. And uh, we learned the, a lot of keys about spiritual victory. First of all, in Romans, we established not only the gospel, chapters 1 through 4, what the gospel is, how that every person is responsible or accountable for having heard the gospel to receive the gospel. We learn that the gospel, in a nutshell, is through faith. In other words, being born again, being saved, is by faith alone. Romans calls it the law of faith. Now it's very interesting because the passage of Scripture we were in last week, which is Romans 8, 28 through uh, 31, a lot of people make that about the gospel. They, they call it foreknowledge and predestination, and they, they take those two words and they apply those words to the gospel, but actually the gospel in Romans is not being addressed. That's the triumphant Christian living that's being addressed in chapter 8. And so if a person just carefully and with an open mind outlines Romans, you're never going to come up with this doctrine of predestination, which isn't from the Bible which takes the word foreknowledge and takes predestination and merges those two concepts and makes what God knows about our being saved, about God's purpose to being saved. It's very clear in, in this passage in Romans, as well as in other places, that God knows who's going to be saved, but it's also very clear that predestination isn't to salvation. Predestination is to confirmation. That is to be conformed to the image of His Son. Every person whom God has ever saved has the same ultimate outcome. And isn't that encouraging? We are on equal ground at the cross of Jesus Christ. And my friend, that is not just a catchy cliche phrase or saying. Anyone who has come to Jesus has the same Holy Spirit, has the same justification, which makes us absolutely righteous, having absolutely the person and the position of what Jesus is with God. And every person who comes to that cross of Jesus is ultimately going to be exactly like Him. We're going to know Him because we're going to be like Him because we're going to see Him as He is. And that is our predestined, or predetermined outcome. And so no person is predestined to be born again. A person who is born again is predestined to be exactly like Jesus. And my friend, we ought to be, with that truth in mind, we ought to be preparing ourselves for the day that we will be out of this body of sin. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I read uh, 1 Corinthians 5 where Paul says, we that are in this body, this tabernacle, he said we groan, earnestly designed that we could be clothed upon with our body which is from heaven. You ever, you ever feel the just the uh, reality of the fact that you live in flesh, a uh, body, that uh, as, long as, as long as you reckon it to be dead, can't make you sin, but a body of sin, body that has a lust to sin, Man, I'll tell you, some days I just think, man, I'd be perfectly glad if uh, my time on this earth were finished. Now, I'll be honest with you. I want to serve the Lord Jesus. I want to have some rewards in heaven. My land, life is not in vain. And by the way, life is good. Uh, life is really good. I love living. And so I don't want to die just so I can get out of living. But friend, I'll just tell you something. I look forward to the day when things are going to be perfect. And that's when I'm, be, when I'm going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. But my predetermined outcome, and yours as well, is exactly the same. You're going to be absolutely 100% just like Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, you, you ever had somebody say, well, you know, it would be really nice if I was born in a Christian home. Well, you know what? I, I, I could wish for every person here that you'd been born in a home where your parents had preached the gospel and taught you how to love and live for Jesus. But that isn't a fact for most of us, actually. Uh, Do you know that many people who uh, were born in a, a home where parents loved Jesus still didn't have a perfect life? and have reasons why they could say that, well, you know what, it'd be nice to be this person or that person. You know something? The great thing about it is is that we're all going to be like Jesus. You, you may be wealthy. You may be living in poverty. You may, be, uh, you may come from a heritage that's godly, or you may come from a heritage that's godless. Cracks me up sometimes when people ask me if I'm related to other preachers. By the, there are a lot of Price preachers out there, Pastor Prices out there. Matter of fact, there's a guy in Missouri... Uh, who got arrested? He got a, he, his his pastor Ryan Price in Missouri, and he got arrested for beating up a, someone who had abused a child. So I'm not too upset about the reason that he got arrested, but.
but uh, people mistake me for him sometimes, <laughs> and, and so forth. I have my own record, but it's uh, not. I haven't gotten a felony or anything like that. So what's that? What part of the Joel, stop asking me questions about illustrations. You do this to me all the time, man. I'm only messing with you. But I'm not going to answer that. I don't know. I can't remember that. I just remember Ryan Price, and I know what he got arrested for. Anyway, people ask me all the time, Pastor Price, are you related to such and such? There's Adolphus Price somewhere, I think, in Georgia. Where's Adolphus Price from, Charlie? Surely you know. Alabama. Alabama. Thank you, Charlie. Okay, ask Charlie these questions, all right? He knows his stuff. All right, so somewhere in Alabama, and... Uh, and uh, people say, oh, you related to Adolphus Price? I said, no, I'm only related to a bunch of scoundrels. <laughs> They're not related to good people, actually. Uh, my parents were first-generation Christians. And so, you know, I could wish sometimes. I remember going to Bible college, and everybody knew the preacher's kids. You know, they, uh, you know, their, their pastors, their, their dads would come and preach in chapel, and everybody knew them. When they went to school, they were already known, and, and uh, they seemed to have certain advantages because of their heritage and so forth. My friend has nothing to do with the way God looks at you or looks at me, where we came from. It has to do with where you're going. And every one of us has a predetermined outcome, that is, whom God did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. We're just going to be just like Jesus. Every single one of us will be exactly the same, regardless, uh, when we are with the Lord. So that's where we, we uh, pick up this morning, where we look at. So we transition from spiritual victory and the the explanation ultimately for spiritual victory being that you and I, because Jesus literally died for us, in God's mind are literally dead with regard to sin. So how does a Christian have victory over sin? Well, Jesus literally died for the sins that I've committed, and it was not figurative, it was, it was literal. And so in God's mind, as far as I'm concerned, because Jesus died for me, I'm dead. And so if you ask the question, well, if God thinks you're dead and you think you're alive to sin, who's delusional? You are God. Well, the honest answer to the question is if Jesus actually died for my sin and I think I'm alive to sin, I'm the one who's delusional. God isn't. And so Romans 6 says, Likewise, reckon ye yourselves also to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And my friend, reckoning is a thinking term. It's literally like taking a cash register that has a printout of what's in the cash register and taking what is printed and accounting it with what actually is added up in the drawer. And those two things have to be reconciled. They have to be made the same. And a lot of times for Christians, we think, well, you know, half the problem is in the mind. No, my friend, for a believer who thinks that sinning is an option, who thinks that he can't have victory, 100% of the battle's in the mind. You've got to agree with God about your sin. If you'll do that, you'll be amazed at the spiritual victory you can have. And friend, it can be as just as simple as getting up in the morning and saying, dead to sin, dead to sin, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead. And remembering, I don't have to determine whether I'm going to do the wrong thing because I'm dead. Dead men don't sin. And so, I, Jesus died for me, I'm dead, therefore I don't sin. And friend, I'm just telling you something. I don't mean to be one of these guys that oversimplifies and says everything's easy, but I'm telling you it's overly simple. Spiritual victory uh, and, and defeat oftentimes is so complicated by all of, the, uh, all of the philosophy and all the psychology that we add into it, when the fact of the matter is the reason a Christian can have life is because you're alive in Christ, and the reason a Christian can have victory is because you're dead. Jesus died for you. Don't forget about that. Get that straight in your mind. Keep, your, keep that continually in your head. The day that you let that lapse in your mind, the truth that you're dead to sin, the day you'll fail, the day you'll fall, and the, the flesh will defeat you because your thinking is messed up. Your thinking isn't right. Okay, so we've come through this passage of the Scripture, and we saw the conclusion beginning in chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made us free from the law of sin and death. So these are the third, three laws we've seen so far in Romans. We saw, first of all, the law of faith, and that salvation is by faith alone. Secondly, we saw the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And so there's a law, God's law, that says you can live for Jesus. The law of sin and death. By the way, I didn't find these in a systematic theology book. I found them in the Bible. In this book, my friend, if you'll get in it and you'll read it, and you, by the help of the Holy Spirit of God, will believe it, you'll be amazed at how transformational God's Word can be in your life, how it transforms your living. 
And now we're merging, we're, we're in a passage of Scripture, our text today, that takes us from the spiritual victory aspect to really answering the question to one of the themes that we've been dealing with all the way through Romans, and that's the Jews and the Greeks. And we've been talking about the gospel, but we've been getting ourselves to the place where we can answer the question, what about Israel? What about Israel? And by the way, my friend, a lot of Christians today need to read Romans because they're messed up on Israel and what God's going to do with Israel. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to, to, to necessarily point out anything about anyone in particular, but you know, folks that are into Reformed theology believe that Israel and the church are one and the same. And so a lot of the things that they believe that really, really hurt the gospel and the cause of the gospel come from the problems that they have with trying to make the covenants that God has promised Israel to be addressed to the church. And I'm not trying to use jargon or get confusing here on you here this morning, but that's, that's the problem with Presbyterian theology, for instance. It mixes up the church in Israel. And in the Old Testament of the Scripture, for instance, Jeremiah, I believe it's 31, 31, very, very plainly lays out God's promise that He's going to give us a new covenant. And the new covenant is to the church. But the old covenants which are yet unfulfilled, which are to Israel, that's the, those are the confusing events for these Jewish believers that are part of the church at Rome who are seeing Gentiles come in and they're confused because the Gentiles, uh, they're, they're not coming in under Moses' law. And Moses' law, though, was for the Jews. And so a lot of those questions they have that, are going, that need to be answered need to be answered. But first, Paul wants to help individuals understand that your destination or your security in your salvation is not because of your spiritual victory. It's because of your salvation. So he spent all this time talking about how that you ought to have spiritual victory and how that you can have spiritual victory. But I'm thankful to God that the Holy Spirit doesn't want us to be confused that our works are first the means for our salvation or even secondarily uh, that we are responsible for working for our salvation. Now, that is our, our deliverance from sin. I know when the Scripture says work out your salvation with fear and trembling, it's not talking in that passage of Scripture. It is not talking about earning our salvation. It's talking about literally practicing out what you have because of the salvation that you have. And so I don't, we, we're not going to deal with that this morning. However, Paul and the Holy Spirit want you to understand that you, once saved, are always saved. And Paul actually uses the point that he built on. We're not going to preach that part of the Scripture, so I'll just mention it to you right now. He uses that point to transition to say that I would be a curse from God if I could, if all Israel would be saved. And he's talking about national Israel. He's talking about the Jews and the Greeks, which is, of course, an underlying theme in Romans. Jews and Greeks. To the Jew first, also to the Greek. Over and over again is mentioned in Romans. And so Paul concludes this passage that we'll, we'll expound on in a moment in Romans 8, which helps us understand our eternal security. And he says, If I could lose my salvation, then I would if Israel would be saved. And that's what Romans 9, 1 through 3, really 1 through 4, moving forward, are about. That's one of the most astonishing statements that a man can make in the Scripture. I thought and thought and thought and thought about who I'd go to hell for. In the eternal nature of hell, he makes such an impression on me that I, I just, I, all I can say is I'm amazed by Paul saying he'd go to hell if Israel could be saved. So he had, as a result of uh, his love for the gospel and his love for Christ, he had a love for Israel that, I, that is unrivaled. We could agree, couldn't we, this morning? In other words, Paul said, if God's people, the Jews, were to be born again, I'd go to hell to make that happen. And the eternal nature of hell, as I've said, is way too much for me. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to burn for 10 minutes. I wouldn't want to be consumed with fire for 10 minutes, but I might consider it. I might consider it if people could go to heaven for eternity. I'd at least think about whether or not I'd do it. You know, once you, once you committed to something, it's too late to back out of it. So you could say, okay, 10 minutes. I don't know if I could burn in a consuming fire for an hour, but I might consider it. I might consider it. I know I'd be terrorized. I, I know that, that the agony of it, the, the physical aspects of it would be more than I can bear, but I might commit to it just because, just because. I'm saying might. I didn't say I would. I might commit to it if somebody could go to heaven for eternity. But Paul said I would be a curse from God for the Jews. And so he goes from the position of explaining that you cannot be a curse from God to saying, if it were possible, I would. 
if Israel would be saved. Now that's not the message this morning, but that is, as a, as a young person, I remember as a teenager reading Romans 9 and being so impressed by the statement that Paul made of the burden and the love that he had for the, lo for the lost. But I said there's something about Paul. There's something about his zeal for the Lord Jesus Christ that sets him apart from me for sure. Now he's just a man. He was just human. But that something about Paul is actually explained in chapter 8. That's something about... You ever ask yourself the question, you know, should I love people enough to, go, to be able to say I'd go to hell for them? Would it be good, even though I could not do so, would it be good if I loved someone enough that I'd be a curse from Christ for their sake? That'd be a deep love, wouldn't it? it would that be an honorable love? I'm going to tell you something. To know somebody that loves like that, would that'd be someone I'd want to know. That would be someone that the characteristics of their life would be worth emulating. And this is just a man we're speaking of, Paul. We're not speaking of Christ, but we're talking about a deep love because of Christ. Let's look at the cause of Paul's love in our message this morning. I want to look at this morning the inseparable love of God. The inseparable love of God. If you take notes and, and you're really trying hard to follow me, uh, then that's the title this morning. Romans 8, verse 31. The Bible says, What shall we then say to these things? What things? Well, that whom God did foreknow, He did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. So Paul's going to ask a series of questions. Some of them are somewhat rhetorical, but each of them are actually answered in our text. First of all, he said this, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? I mentioned a couple of weeks ago phrases that uh, drive me batty, and I think that just are a natural part of our vocabulary, but are so not true that they ought to be erased from our vocabulary. And one of those uh, phrases was, I had no choice, or I can't help it, or I don't care. I, you, you ever hear Christians say this? Well, I just, I couldn't, I can't help it. Man, it, you, you can't help a Christian. Even with Bible truth, let me tell you something. God can't help a Christian that says he can't help it. Because that Christian is in his declaration saying, God can't help me, or I won't allow God to help me. The reality of it, my friend, is that God can help anybody, but anyone who begins with saying, I had no choice, I couldn't help it, and he's talking about sin, or he's talking about a wrong decision, any person who begins with that premise believes in a God who is helpless to help him. And so Paul asked the question, he said, if we are predestinated to be conformed to the image of Christ, what shall we say to these things. What's our conclusion now? He said, first, if God be for us, who can be against us? Do you remember little David when he went where the Philistines and, and the men of Israel, the armies of Israel and the Philistines had set the battle in array in the valley? You remember David's question when Goliath came out and challenged? He said, who's that? Who is a person who thinks that he can defy the armies of the living God. In other words, David's thing is that guy is nuts. Goliath is crazy. He had no qualms. You, hey, David, you know, I, I actually heard a Christian on the radio, a Bible teacher on a conservative radio station this week, teaching about David, and I thought I'd like to wring that guy's neck. That wasn't a very nice thing to think, probably. But he said something about the fact that David had skill. He believed in his skill, and he was... You know, he had prepared himself. No, no, no. The bottom line is David was good with a sling. Uh, I don't want... I, wouldn't, I like to wrestle people. I wouldn't want to wrestle David. Because the fact of the matter is the guy grabbed a bear and killed it with his bare hands. He grabbed a lion. You know, he might mess up wrestling me and actually, you know, take me by the beard and destroy me or something. David was a rough guy. But I'm just telling you something. Goliath was a guy that would have to, you know, kind of go down a little bit to dunk. You know, or just, you know, he dunk at this level. You know, he's a big guy. I mean, you, you think about the proportions of Goliath. You look at the weight measurements of his shield and of the beam of his spear and so forth. He's a massive guy. And David's question about Goliath is, who is that guy? And what in the world is he thinking defying the armies of the living God? In other words, David had a very, very small estimation of anyone but God in his mind. And so when David told Saul, hey, I'll go fight him. And Saul said, you're just a lad. He's a man of war from his youth. You're just a youth, and he's been a man of war since his youth. Who are you to fight? And David didn't care a bit about who he was. He didn't care a bit about who Goliath was because David understood the same thing Paul was asking. Who is able to separate us from the love of God? Or who is able to, uh, in, in uh, 1 
verse, I'm jumping ahead. Uh, Verse 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? Who can oppose God? What's the answer to the question? No one. (laughs) No one. Listen, my friend, everything that is, everyone that is, was created by God and is therefore vastly inferior to Him. And you as a believer, when you look at opposition, particularly in the area of sin or in the area of evil in your life, have vastly overrated evil if you think that evil can oppose one who has God for them. I, I, I like the bumper sticker, right, don't you? God is my co-pilot. And then the bumper sticker that's better than the bumper sticker which says God is my pilot. Well, I've watched some people drive and I don't think God's doing it, to be honest with you. But <laughs> the reality of it is, is that, uh, you know, a lot of times we try to be super spiritual and try to say, well, I'm with God. You know, it's not just God's with me, I'm with God. Well, I understand the theological significance of that and how important it is to understand that you're on God's team, He's not on yours. But Paul here said, if God is before us, if God be for us, now Christian, I want you to understand something. God's for you. God is for you. When you were dead in your trespasses and sins, or as as the Scripture puts it, when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, God was for you. It's a, it is astonishing to me to recognize that when I was ungodly, God not only knew my name, but desired for me to come to Him in repentance and to receive Christ as my Savior. You know, this, this idea that God doesn't care, or God isn't involved, or God you know, isn't the cause that's righteous, you know, and that is your cause, that God isn't part of that cause, my friend, is absolutely ludicrous. God's for you! He, he, I'll just tell you something. What a futile attempt to try and do anything that you think that God isn't for. I mean, friend, I don't just need God to be neutral. I need God to be for what I'm doing. Isn't it so? I mean, we want to go soul winning, don't we? We want to go out and knock on doors and tell people about Jesus. I want God to be for that, not neutral to it. I don't want a cause to be mine. I want it not just to be mine, but I want God to want it to happen. You know, we pray for and we schedule things that on purpose we're going to use to preach the gospel like our three-on-three basketball tournament. I don't want to have a three-on-three basketball tournament that I doubt whether God knows about or is involved in or is concerned with. I want a three-on-three basketball tournament that God's for. I'll tell you something, if God's for it, I kind of believe it's going to go well. kind of believe that no one can really prevent it or stop it from going well. If God be for us, who can be against us? How in the world do you think Paul and Silas sang praises to God in the jail at Philippi? It was not because they knew there was about to be an earthquake and a revival in the jailer's house. It was because they knew God was for them. And boy, that's a big difference in perspective, isn't it? See, Paul knew while he's in prison, he knew God's for me. And so it's okay to be in prison as long as God's for you, it's going to come out all right. Okay, so now the the hypothetical question, who can be against us? Well, anyone can be against you, but what kind of force will they have to stop you? Christian, you and I understand that both the saved believer and the church that the believer is part of are an unstoppable force. The Scripture says that that when Christ established His church, He said that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In other words, hell itself can't stop a believer who God is for. What believer is God for? Every single one of them. Okay? So now, here's the second question. He that spared not his own son... It sounds like it's a statement, but the the one that spared not his own son. Who was it that didn't spare his own son? God. God. Okay? But delivered him up for us all. Who is that? That's God. God delivered Jesus up for us all. How shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? If God is so benevolent and so generous as to give His righteous Son for the ungodly, where does the notion that God won't do anything else come from? I mean, just here, this, this question is about the character of God. If when you are without strength, if you are ungodly, Christ dies for you, if God does that for you, what are the chances that, you know, He might be a benevolent God? See, God's holy character is way beyond ours, isn't it? 
The injustice of Christ dying for my sin is not something that falls short of my comprehension. Is it yours? You ever think about how unright, it, how wrong it was that Jesus died for you? I do. I would never have had the audacity to ask Jesus to die, but I readily <laughs> realize that since He has, there's no question about God's love, and I'm ready to ask for what for the work of the cross to be to be attributed to my account. I couldn't ask Jesus to die, but I'm glad He did. And boy, I'll tell you something. I very, very, I run to the cross. I reach for the gospel, for the salvation. I want it, the free gift of eternal life. <coughs> Moving forward, the Bible says in verse 33, here's a, here's a third question. First question, if God's for us, who can be against us? No one. He that spared not his son, is he going to freely give us all things? Yes. Verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. In, in the Revelation, we see that the Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. So who's going to lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Well, Satan's going to at least try. And a lot of other folks can. But who does the charge have any kind of deadly or even any kind of force at all? In other words, what charge can be laid against those whom God has saved? Could they say you've fallen, you've failed? Is that a charge? Could anyone lay that charge? Well, they could bring the accusation, but Christ, my friend, has satisfied the accusation through His death. God's answer in each instance is Christ died for that. Charge dismissed. Paid for. Verse 34. Who is He that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. And here is our transition verse. Notice this. We have been emphasizing the aspect of the gospel that has to do with the death of Jesus, but now we're going to emphasize the resurrection. I'm just telling you something. A Christian who ignores the death of Jesus Christ will be a Christian who lives in spiritual defeat because they don't understand that they're dead. But if you understand that the gospel is only that Jesus died for you, my friend, you're missing the other aspect of the gospel. The, another important part of that, that is that Jesus is risen from the dead. So it says, It is Christ, verse 34, that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. This is one of those verses in the Bible that I scribble all over in my Bible and write, Me! This verse is about me. Jesus is praying for me. When you read in the Scripture, and again, this is not our study, but earlier in Romans 8, we saw, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know that we should know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Jesus Christ is, the Holy Spirit of God represents Jesus Christ in us, and it is Jesus Christ who is making those prayers on our behalf, on behalf of the saints. Literally, Christ prays for us. The example of that, when Jesus prayed to God for His disciples before He went to the cross, was that Jesus not only prayed for His disciples and said, You've, I've kept them while I was in this world, now Father, You keep them. And then He prayed, I pray also for them that will believe. My friend, God is for you, and Jesus is praying for you. Amen. That's amazing, isn't it? God is for you, and Jesus is praying for you. And the question is, if Jesus is making intercession for us, who's He that condemneth? No one. Nothing. We better finish. We're almost out of time. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Here's a list of hypotheticals in Psalm 21, 22, or 20, uh, 42, 20, 44, 22 is quoted here. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? I recognize this morning that I could preach each of those, uh, what each of those are. We could spend a lot of time defining. But the, there's a list of things that are all inclusive. Verse 36, we see an Old Testament scripture quoted, Psalm 44, 22. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. And the question, the answer to the question is in verse 37, Nay! So who shall separate us from Christ, from the love of Christ? There's a long list. Nay! For in all these things, or in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. And now we go from the place of asking the question of can we be defeated to the realization 
that not only can we not be defeated, but we are the conquerors. In other words, those that would defeat us, and I'm not speaking hypotheticals of faces and names, I'm talking of evil. My friend, we are the ones who conquer evil. It is not evil that conquers us. <laughs> I don't know about you, but this is a pretty helpful passage of Scripture for me. It's pretty good when it comes to getting your thinking straight about what you are in the Lord Jesus Christ because of what God has done. My friend, I'm not just dead to sin, but I'm out defeating it as a result of the love of Christ. And this is the last thing that we look at this morning. See, we've moved to the place of the love of God. In verse uh, 37, we are more than conquerors for Him that loved us. Verse 38, and Paul said, and this explains his thinking. I asked the question at the beginning, how could a man say he'd go to hell for someone else? Well, Paul said, for I am persuaded. To persuade means to be convinced or to be sure or certain of a thing, right? Paul said, I'm certain about something. And I think, well, if Paul could say something like what he said, then I want to know what he was thinking. And here's what he's thinking. He said, I am persuaded. He said that neither death, he said, uh, nor life, nor angels. Now, I don't know about you, but angels are a little bit real and a little bit of a terrifying concept for me. You know, you realize that man's made a little lower than the angels. We're talking about ability or power. When someone is better or greater than I am, more powerful than I am, I'm a little more afraid if they have an evil intent. If the angels of Satan were created by God and angels are a higher being than you and I are. Are demons more powerful than you? In your strength, the answer is yes. But Paul said, I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, and then he goes on to say, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, and he talks about these things that are way greater than us. He said, nor things present, nor things to come. And I love the statements of things that are and things which are future. You know, a lot, of, a lot of believers, a lot of people in general are afraid of the future. And then I think the greatest reason they're afraid of the future is because they're afraid to die. But we could get into that and discuss it. We won't this morning. But Paul goes on to say, I'm persuaded that none of these things... Then he goes on to just, just speak in terms of, of, uh, of, of expanse. Neither, he said, neither height nor depth. As high as you can go, as low as you can go. He said, nor any other creature. He said, or any, anything that you can think of that I haven't listed. And then he goes on to say, shall be able to separate us or, from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And here Paul speaks of the inseparable love of God. And friend, if you have ever received Jesus as your Savior, you are inseparably loved by God. The inseparable love of God. And here we come back to a form of grammar that helps us to understand that it is not our love for God, but it is God's love of us. In other words, it's God's love that makes us inseparable, not our love. Man, I'll tell you, when you don't love God like you ought to, you don't feel very uh, like much like a conqueror, do you? Uh, has there ever been a believer who has not questioned his eternal security? whether or not he's saved. Has anyone ever been born who has not wondered? I wonder if I really meant it. I wonder if I'm really saved. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. My friend, you can wonder that all you like and it has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that God loves you and if you've received Christ, His love for you is then inseparable. And your eternal security is not conditioned on your actions any more than your salvation would be because we'd all be condemned. But my friend, your eternal security is conditioned on the character and nature of a God who has predestinated that we will be conformed to the image of His Son. And friend, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I want to conclude with a couple of important points of application. Will, will you permit me? First, don't give up on someone God isn't done with. Don't give up on someone that God isn't finished with. Because His love for them is <laughs> inseparable. God cannot be stopped in His love toward one who is His own, one who is His child. Therefore, they will be ultimately like Jesus. Sadly, I believe that what the Scripture says, that there is a sin unto death. 
But that sin unto death for a believer has an outcome that is ultimately that person is now like Jesus. They've been separated from a body of sin, but they are inseparably loved by God. And so they will be like Him when they see Him as He is. But if God isn't finished and He's giving them breath, if they're still breathing, then my friend, they can still be conformed to the image of Christ. They can still change. I, I question the theology of a person that would say they'll never change. About anyone who is a child of God's. I sometimes feel as though, you know what, I can't do anymore. Nothing more that I can say, nothing more than I can do. But my friend, God's inseparable love is not finished. I love that in ministry I have been privileged to be in ministry long enough to have seen people go away and for the love of God to bring them back. Never give up on people. Secondly, you might as well just submit to the love of God because He'll never give up on you. If you're away, if you've strayed, if you've said, you know what, I'm just going to accept where I'm at. I'm just going to accept where things are. My friend, you might as well accept that ultimately you're going to be conformed to the image of Christ and you might as well get there sooner than later. Because nothing can separate you from the love of God. Now we could say, uh, we, could, we could expound on the Scripture this morning for hours and hours, but uh, this is a passage of Scripture that you need to make your own. You need to get into this portion of Romans. I recommend memory. I recommend for you to read it over and over again and to pray over each concept and study it so well that you understand how inseparable God's love for you is. It will affect your living. And it will give you a little insight into what Paul said when he said, I could wish that I were myself a curse from Christ for my brethren's sake. What was it that made, Christ, made Paul able to say that? He was convinced of the nature of God's love. Father, thank you for what we've learned this morning. I ask that you would allow it to sink in, that it would make an impression in our hearts in such a way, Lord, that we would be convinced that nothing can separate us from your love and that we would live in light of this truth, both in how we respond to those who are straying from you in fellowship, Lord, but help us to understand you don't give up on people, and we shouldn't either. And then, Father, help us to understand how you look at us when we are not in fellowship with you. Lord, I pray that you would allow these truths to sink into our hearts in a permanent way so that we could be more like Jesus, whose name we pray it in. Amen. I think my microphone just quit at a very appropriate time. So, <laughs> um, Let's dismiss in prayer. Uh, normally I'd have an invitation at the end of the service. Um, I think every one of us should respond to an invitation on a message like what we had this morning. So I'll ask you to let God take His Word and let it do its work in your heart and your life. If you're here this morning, you don't know that Jesus is your Savior, my friend, God loves you very much, and Jesus died and if for your sin. That's an evidence of God's love. And you could simply receive Him by praying and saying, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know Jesus died for my sins. And ask for that free gift of eternal life, my friend. God will save you, and you'll be inseparably loved by Him. Okay? If you have any questions about the passage of Scripture or anything else like that, I'm available for you. Let's dismiss with prayer. Father, thank you for what you've taught us here today. And I ask that you would help us, Lord, to have both a knowledge and an admiration for the Scripture so that we could be changed in light of what it teaches. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>